Well, many years ago now, uh, my brother Joe and I co-led a short-term mission team to Bolivia. Uh, We spent six weeks with a basketball team of ex-college players traveling all over the country, playing exhibition games, and then sharing the gospel in various forms with all the people who would come out to watch the games. It was a great adventure, and I've told stories about those trips uh, many, many times. You may remember this one. Most of our travel was done uh, by bus, these ancient Bolivian school buses that looked like they'd been driven for about 20 years and then left on the bottom of an ocean for about 10 years and then pulled out of the ocean and put back in service for another 10 years. That's what these buses looked like. We made several long drives in these buses through mountains on narrow dirt roads with no guardrails. They looked a lot like that. In fact, that road is in Bolivia. That might be one of the ones we actually drove on. Uh, So you have no guardrails. You could look down over the side of the road and you could see tiny little crosses at the bottom of these ravines. And that was not comforting to see, tiny little crosses at the bottom of the ravines because it meant that some travelers came to an abrupt stop right at that point. So we're chugging our way up this narrow dirt mountain road when our Bolivian bus driver suddenly starts yelling, mira, mira, mira. That means look, look, look. So we looked up. And he's holding the gear shifter up in his hand like it's a scepter, like it's a sword. It's coming completely out of the floor, out of the gearbox. And he's holding it, and the bus is still moving. It's going up the mountain. So my brother and I are sitting right in the front. We're the leaders of the trip. We have no idea what to do except prepare for certain death, which we see the little white crosses down there. Then a 19-year-old kid named Curtis, who was on our trip, uh, who had grown up in South America with missionary parents, comes running up to the front of the bus. And he goes, you guys mind if I help? And we're going, duh. Because uh, he, uh, so Curtis then grabs the, the gear shifter out of the guy's hand, stands over the gearbox and just jams it, and jams it into the gearbox and holds it there with all his might because he had seen this happen before. He grew up in South America. He holds it there until the bus slowly goes and we pull off into this mountain village and we come to a stop. So we're relieved, we're alive, but now we're stuck in a mountain village in Bolivia. Uh, the driver and Curtis talk in Spanish real quickly, and then Curtis looks at us and says, we're going into the village. We said, what for? He says, we're going to find a welder to fix this gearbox. We said, a welder? Like that was the dumbest thing we'd ever heard. We're in a tiny mountain village surrounded by chickens and llamas, and you're going to find a welder? A couple minutes later, Curtis comes back to the bus and says, we found a welder, but it's his day off. <laughs> My brother and I are going, his day off? He lives in Bolivia. Tell him we'll pay him double, triple. Just get him out here and fix this bus. Well, a few minutes later, Curtis comes back with a Bolivian man, little tiny Bolivian guy, wearing a welder's helmet with an acetylene torch. I, 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 could, I, I wouldn't have believed it in a million years. Crawls under the bus, fixes the bus in about 10 minutes, and we go on, off on our way. And I can remember to this day thinking in my head at that moment, I wouldn't have missed this adventure for anything. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. We're in a series now called, this the final series in the book of Acts that we've been studying all year long. It's called Shipwrecks, Riots, and Prison, The Reaching Adventure. Now, the word adventure can be defined as an unusual, exciting, usually hazardous experience or activity. I think the book of Acts, or as it should properly be translated, the title anyway, the Acts of the Apostles is what it reads in Greek, uh, should actually be renamed the Adventure of the Gospel, or maybe the Adventure of the Church, or the Great Adventure of Following Jesus. Because after all, the title is not the ideas of the Apostles, it's not the doctrines of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Apostles. It's what men like Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy did to take the gospel to the world. And what they did was go on a great adventure. Last week, Jeff shared with you um, uh, through Acts chapter 20, uh, Paul's farewell address to the leaders of the church in Ephesus. Now, I'm backing up one chapter to talk about what happened in Ephesus that led to that. So we're in Acts chapter 19 today. So you can open your Bibles or look on the screens. And we're going to cover, again, this, this is a long chapter, some long narrative portions I think it's important that we try to cover them. I think a sermon will emerge from this, so be patient. We're going to go fast and slow at the same time, if we can. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came 
to Ephesus. A little background. Remember, Paul spent 18 months in Corinth. That was where he met Priscilla and Aquila. That's where we saw the really cool story of that guy named Sosthenes, if you remember. If you didn't see that sermon or hear it, then go on, the inter- go on uh, FECG.com and listen to it. It's a really cool story at the end about Sosthenes. Around that same time, this guy named Apollos shows up in the story. He's a brilliant teacher. He needs to be coached a little bit because he knows a lot about John the Baptist, not so much about Jesus. And now we see Paul moving on to the adventure of Ephesus. Now, moving to any new town or city is always something of an adventure. I don't know the last time you moved to a new city. Maybe you're new in this area. But at the end of that team trip to Bolivia, my wife and I, along with my brother and his young family, stayed in the city of Santa Cruz, Bolivia, to teach for six months at a small Christian university there. And even though it was only six months, every single day was an adventure. It was an adventure trying to communicate in a new language. Uh, We learned that speaking English slower and louder doesn't help people speak Spanish to understand what you want. It just doesn't. It was an adventure learning a new culture. We never did exactly understand when it was okay in that culture to be two hours late for an event and when you had to be on time. We just never quite figured that out. It was an adventure learning to figure out uh, how we could get uh, eggs, gas, and milk in the same morning because they were all at different places and sometimes they didn't have that what you wanted. But then there came the driving. How many of you have ever driven in a developing, uh, underdeveloped world, uh, nation? Anybody? Like Bolivia, South America, somewhere like that. Well, Santa Cruz had traffic lights, but almost none of them worked. And if by any chance one was working, it was completely ignored. Uh, the, the rules of driving were unwritten, but they were very clear. It took a while to learn them, but they were very clear. For example, when you were coming to an intersection, lights didn't work, so you just started honking your horn. Everybody honked their horn. So everybody come from every direction, honk their horn. And if you honked first, you had the right of way. Except if the other car was bigger, if it was a truck, even if he honked second, he had the right of way. Okay, so you got that? So you honk first, and that's that guy's bigger, then he goes first. And everybody had turn signals, but most of them didn't work, so they didn't use them. And so what they simply would do is the driver stuck his hand out the window as he's driving, and we just go like this. And that meant I'm going to do something. Best I can tell. I'm going to do something. Watch out. Paul here strikes out in a new adventure, the city called Ephesus. As Jeff mentioned last week, Ephesus was on the west coast of the region we call Turkey. So you can see it up there written in red. So he's come back over. He's he's no longer in Europe. He's now in Asia again, or Asia Minor. Uh, Ephesus was a large city, a port city. At its peak, about 400,000 people lived there. Uh, The Romans called it the crown jewel of Asia Minor. You'll see why in just a moment. The people of Ephesus were proud of the great library that was there. At the time, one of the largest libraries in the world. I actually visited this spot and took my own picture. This is not my picture, but this is a, you see the people at the bottom? This is a huge, enormous building that was simply an ancient library. It's phenomenal to look at. The city was also known for its huge theater. I've been at this place as well. This one theater uh, sat 25,000 people at one time. That's more than fit in the United Center down in Chicago. This theater becomes very important later in this chapter. Um, It also was home, uh, it was a heavily pagan city, just like Corinth. Uh, It was the home of the great temple of Artemis, who is believed to be the mother goddess of fertility in that region. Now, the temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 120 massive columns covered an area roughly the size of Soldier Field in Chicago. 50,000 worshipers could fit in this building at one time. Uh, But today, only a single column remains from that great structure. And there it is. You could, you could travel there today and you can see it. One column remains because ancient Ephesus today is in ruins. So, but, but when Paul went there, it was a great city, a pagan city, uh, with no guarantee anyone would be interested in what Paul had to say. But he was ready for the adventure of Ephesus. Luke continues, Paul came to Ephesus and there he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now we enter the second part of the story, which I'm calling the adventure of the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, a woman called me after church on a Sunday and asked for an appointment. So the next day we met in my office. She came into my office and sat down. And almost immediately I could see her eyes begin to glisten with tears. Uh, She said, I've been coming to your church for about three weeks now. And every time I walk into the sanctuary, it was at East Campus, she said, this happens. I start crying, but I'm not sad. Can you tell me what's happening to me? I asked her a couple of questions about her church and religious background. And then I said, I don't want this to sound weird or scary to you, but I think what you're feeling 
is the Holy Spirit drawing you into a relationship with Jesus. Her eyes got wide and she went, that's it. That's what I want. And so we talked some more and we prayed together and her relationship with Jesus started that day. Luke says the first thing Paul does in Ephesus is find some disciples. We found out later that these are followers of John the Baptist's teachings and he asked them a strange question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into then what baptism, into then Into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul finds out these disciples are committed to repentance and righteousness, but they know nothing of Jesus and the promise of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they are religious but don't know what it is to have relationship with Jesus. And this way, I think these disciples were the ancient equivalent of people today who maybe have been religious or have gone to church even most of their lives, but who have not understood what it is to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Christianity, properly understood, is not a religion at all, despite popular opinion. It's a relationship. Let me say that again. Christianity is not a religion, first and foremost. It's a relationship. Another way to say it is this. Religion is like a beautiful car sitting in a garage. Picture a beautiful sports car, one of your dreams, sitting in a garage. It's beautiful, but it's got no gas. Okay? The Holy Spirit is the gas in the tank of the car. That now car is nice to look at, but without gas has no power to take me anywhere, to transform me in any way. But the Holy Spirit is what transforms religion into a relationship. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives through faith in Jesus. Sometime later, Paul wrote a letter to this young church in Ephesus after he had left. And he was sure to remind them of this very truth. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. There it is. There's the gospel. Christ died, rose again for our salvation to forgive our sins. We celebrated that tonight through communion. And then he says, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Paul is teaching them and us that we, that we begin a relationship with Christ when we believe the message of the gospel and that our relationship with him is sealed by the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in our hearts at the moment we believe. Now, the Holy Spirit is one of the most powerful and mysterious and important parts of our faith as followers of Jesus, but often we're somewhat oblivious to what it is and what the person is and what the Spirit does. Quick refresher course. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus in spiritual form who lives in our hearts by faith. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit seals our salvation, guarantees it. The Holy Spirit teaches, guides, convicts. The Holy Spirit helps us pray. The Holy Spirit helps bear fruit in our lives as we grow to be more like Christ. How does the Spirit come? The Spirit enters our lives by faith. Question, does it require the laying on of hands as we see Paul do in this story? Well, not always. Paul doesn't always do that. Here he does it symbolically to make sure they know they're included in the story of the gospel. Does it always produce speaking in tongues and prophesying as it does in this story? Well, sometimes, but not always. Sometimes receiving Christ and coming to faith is a, is, is a very emotional experience, like a waterfall gushing through someone. I saw that to that, that woman that day years ago. Other times it's quieter, like the gentle rising of the sun, slowly in someone's heart and soul. It's individual and it's personal. The Spirit is what makes Jesus personal. The Holy Spirit is central to Christian theology and crucial to the Christian experience. It's by the Holy Spirit that we know Jesus. It's by the Holy Spirit that we pray. It's by the Holy Spirit that we experience God in worship. It's by the Holy Spirit we are transformed bit by bit into what God has called us to become. Now, Luke tells us there were about 12 of these disciples, and they become the first little Christian congregation in Ephesus. 
Paul stays with them for about three years. And the adventure of the Spirit continues. Jump to verse 11. And caught men. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, <coughs> excuse me, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. I've got to pause here for a second, or else you just read this as a, as a weird Bible story. We were visiting the Middle East back a few months ago with a team from FECG, and we were blessed to meet several people who had spent most of their lives in, uh, in Islamic culture and in the Islamic faith, uh, but had eventually become followers of Jesus through uh, uh, really different kinds of stories. And I'll never forget their stories. One of them was a woman who told us that there was a time in her life when she developed a tumor on her neck. And the doctors told her she had to have surgery, and she was very frightened. She had prayed and prayed and prayed to Allah, she said, and nothing ever happened. She knew one Christian friend in her whole life. And so she asked her Christian friend, what should I do? And the Christian friend said, ask Jesus to help you. She didn't know Jesus at all from anybody. She didn't even know how to pray. So all she did that night before she went to bed was she said out loud in her home, Jesus, please help me. That was it. Jesus, please help me. That night she had a dream, and in the dream... Jesus, it's a long story, but Jesus appeared in her dream, put his hand to her neck, and when she woke up in the morning, the tumor was gone. This is her story. Went to the doctor's doctor said, you no longer need surgery, the tumor is gone. Now, you hear a story like that? I heard that story that day, and part of me is going, really? How does that happen? And I'm a pastor, right? It's, it's extraordinary. You hear stories like that, and you go, well, what, does, that, does stuff like that still happen? How, how does stuff like that happen? Why does God do that there? Why didn't he do it for my friend? <clears throat> you have a lot of questions. Notice here, Paul is not the one doing the miracles. Luke tells us it was God working, doing them by the hands of Paul. Very significant. It sounds as if Paul's not even aware of what's happening. He wears aprons when he makes tents. His handkerchiefs, when he's sweaty, he drops them. Somebody picks them up and takes them off. And, and through what's in those handkerchiefs, people are getting better. Paul's not even trying to do that. The point is that God does what he does when and how he wants to do it. His power is not for rent. It's not for sale. It can't be conjured up for our own purposes. The next few verses in the story make that very clear. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, how many of you knew that phrase is in the Bible? Okay. Undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? Luke writes this in almost a humorous way. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced the magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Remember that great library? Books were really important to the Ephesians. Now they're burning them. And they counted the value of them, found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is one of the stranger little stories in the book of Acts, but you need to see what's going on here. These seven sons of Sceva saw what was happening with Paul. They saw God doing these miraculous things, and they wanted a piece of the action. They wanted that power for themselves. So they start trying to use it without either understanding or honoring the God whose power they were trying to invoke. And as Luke tells us, it did not turn out well for them. They chose poorly. You don't play with fire. You don't play with the power of God Almighty. But why does God sometimes choose to do his miracles? Listen again to what Luke says. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That's the reason. Throughout the New Testament, the miracle is never the point. The miracle is never the point. It's what happens next that's the point. The name of Jesus is glorified and extolled, and the word continues to increase. Those are the reasons God does his work and his miracles. Do miracles still happen? I believe they do. Are we to pray for healing and ask God to help us and those we love? Absolutely. But we're to remember that God cannot be manipulated or coerced. We're to remember that while God can and does do the miraculous, his greater purpose remains making Jesus known 
and increasing the impact of his word. That leads us to the third part of the story that I'm calling the adventure of faith. The adventure of faith. When we came up with the title of this last series in Acts, it was months ago, we called it Shipwrecks, Riots, and Prison. Not the happiest of titles, I understand. Jeff is teasing me about that now. Uh, we had no idea that we would actually be dealing with an actual riot in our own country. What's happened in Baltimore and before that in Ferguson is heartbreaking on all sides. I think we would agree. And I believe the gospel speaks to all sides of that situation. As the people of God, we are to be ambassadors for Christ who share what the Bible calls the message of reconciliation with God first and with each other second. We're not to see people any longer through labels like black, white, rich, poor, American, Asian, whatever. No longer. We are to see men and women created in the image of God, loved desperately by Jesus. On the other hand, the gospel offers a way other than violence and looting. It offers peace and hope. In this little story, the Holy Spirit takes Paul on an adventure that includes a real and very dangerous riot. Verse 23, about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. Now the way was just people, uh, a shorthand way of, peop of people referring to this new Christian movement they did not yet have a name for. Uh, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, remember the goddess of fertility, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These were, these, uh, he gathered together uh, with workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods with, made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. So what's happening here? The gospel is reaching people. The gospel is transforming individuals. The gospel is transforming a community because the gospel is now changing the economic structure of a whole city. Do you see that? While it seems like a very unusual story, we've seen this happen in history time and again. Think about whole industries built on what could be called sin and idolatry. Think about the slave trade of the 18th and 19th centuries. The gospel confronted that through a man named William Wilberforce in England. Think about the sex trafficking industry today. Churches around the world are banding together to begin to confront the evil of sex trafficking. The gospel confronts any industry built on the degradation of human beings created in the image of God and loved desperately by Jesus. As a result, the gospel confronts the ultimate idol of our culture, of our world, which is money. Money. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus taught there's room for only one God in every human heart. When Paul preached the gospel in Ephesus, he preached that Jesus was the God who became flesh, who died and rose again, that our sins may be forgiven. He preached there is no other God besides Jesus, and faith in Jesus is the only way to salvation. In other words, when Jesus comes into our hearts by faith, all other gods, small g, must be dismissed. Must be dismissed dismissed. And this is why the Ephesians rioted. This is why they threatened to kill Paul and his companions. No one likes to have his or her idols challenged. So a riotous crowd forms, and since they can't find Paul, evidently, they drag Paul's friends into that theater that I showed you moments ago, 25,000 people. Verse 35, and when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, now the town clerk is the equivalent of an ancient mayor, Chosen by Romans to keep order, so he had a lot of authority. The, quiet, uh, the crowd quiets down. He said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? They believe that an image of, of Artemis fell out of the heavens and was in that temple. 
Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. Actually, they kind of were. He's just trying to smooth things over. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are already in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, once again, Paul and his team are protected by a secular authority. Town clerk wants to preserve order, uh, so he warns the crowd that if they riot, the Romans are going to come in, they're going to lose some of their privileges. He tells them to express whatever the complaints they have through the legal means, do it the right way. And he dismissed them. Some scholars believe this is evidence that Paul already had friends in high places. That he already had the respect of some of the leaders because he was a man of great intelligence, integrity, and grace. Okay, I started off this chapter, and it's been a whirlwind, talking about adventure. An adventure is an unusual, sometimes hazardous experience or activity. I pointed out that the book of Acts itself could be renamed the adventure of the gospel. And I think the Apostle Paul knew a thing or two about both, the gospel and adventure. Years later, when he wrote that letter to the Ephesian church to encourage them, people he had lived with for three years, people he had led out of idolatry into the church, relationship with Christ, he wrote this, Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 16, one of my very favorite passages in all the New Testament. He writes, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There it is. He knew the adventure begins when we put our faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit invades our hearts with the power of God. He continues, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. He knew the gospel adventure had to be sustained by the love of Christ greater than the known dimensions of the universe. That's what he was referring to. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he knew that the gospel adventure takes us to places we would never imagine in our wildest dreams. He finishes, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I think there are some people, maybe even some of you, who think the Christian life sounds kind of boring. You know, we sit in church, sing a few songs, sit around reading our Bible all day, you know, boring. While those certainly aren't bad things to do, following Jesus is about a whole lot more than that. It is. I think of Art and Dorothy Helwig, people in their 60s who left FBCG and started a ministry, an HIV AIDS ministry in Nigeria that touched over 10,000 people in 10 years. In their 60s. I think of Brock and Nancy Luganville who took their family to Ecuador and started a church based on a skate park. If you didn't see their gospel story last weekend, go online to fpcg.com and watch their story. I think of Elise West in Ukraine building a home for young men with special needs. I think of those who serve in Buddy Break, ministering to children and families who suffer with special needs. I think of those who, who serve in our Shepherd's Heart food pantry. You never know who's going to walk in and what kind of needs are going to be met. I think of those who invite friends to join their all-time bestseller book club and are going to ask questions. They don't know God. They don't know Jesus. They don't know what's going to happen. That's an adventure. I think of those who lead students in D groups. That's an adventure. You don't know what they're going to say. It's an adventure to follow Jesus. It's not just a set of beliefs. It's not just a set of doctrines. It's not just a set of ideas. It's an experience and it's a lifestyle. It's the great adventure of reaching the world with the gospel that transforms people, families, communities, and indeed the world. It's a journey of faith and love and hope and courage that includes joys and sorrows and dangers and triumphs. It's a mountain bus ride with no gear shifter. That's what it's like. One of my dreams is that someday I'll, I'll overhear this imaginary, it's an imaginary conversation right now in my head, but I'll overhear it somewhere. It'll be between a student or young person that is embedded and growing up in this church and one of their friends. 
from college or high school or whatever. And the friend is going to say, dude, I just got back from kayaking the waterfalls of Australia. And the kid from FECG is going to say, hey, that's really cool. But that's nothing compared to what my church does. That's nothing compared to following Jesus. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, for the book called the book of Acts, for the great adventure of the gospel. Grant us the courage and the boldness to follow you wherever you would lead. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.